our cat likes my birthday present. My son got me this. It's one of the old timey uh, industrial carts or dock carts that you can push around. These things are you know, usually go for quite a bit of money in the antique stores, usually like a couple hundred bucks. He got this one for 75 because obviously this one was not, you know, cleaned up and then sold as an antique. It's kind of in original condition except for just someone started to do a little bit of light sanding on the on the deck boards there but uh, it's about uh, 24 by 48 it's a nice size just need to make a set of uh, uprights and a crossbar to push it around and I can move uh, move things in the shop the way they used to do a hundred years ago Hey, welcome back to Engineer's Workshop. Well, I'm over here by the Skinner steam engine, and I decided that uh, I wanted to play with the steam chest a bit. It's been a while since I've done anything, and it's my birthday, and why not? I want to play with my steam engine. So this is an 11 by 12 uh, steam engine, 11 inch bore, 12 inch stroke. And it is a very advanced and very new steam engine, per se. We, I think it was actually built in the 40s, probably, by the serial numbers. And what makes this engine somewhat unique is the fact that it has, instead of the old you know, flyball governors, which everybody's used to seeing, it has an inertial governor built into the flywheel. And that was done to have a very, very close regulation of speed this usually, uh, this one particularly ran a dynamo, and they used them for elevator service, lighting uh, in buildings, and you had to have very, very constant speed, loads coming on and off with the elevator cars going up and down. And the engine had to be able to react quickly and maintain a steady RPM for that kind of service. So the inertial governor is almost instantaneous acting. It basically advances due to centrifugal action until it's regulating the speed but if there's any change in flywheel speed the position of that governor mechanism relative to the flywheel changes instantly because everything's spinning and you know body in motion wants to remain in motion so that governor assembly is spinning and if that flywheel if energy gets taken out of the flywheel the position of the governor relative to the flywheel will change and it will instantly affect the stroke of the valve and dump more steam in, bringing the speed back up. So what I want to do is clean up the surface of this uh, port and start scraping in the face of the port so that the valve has a better seal against that surface. I tried to run this on compressed air and there was so many leaks in this engine I, I couldn't even get it to, to turn. So let me show you what I did with the back surface, the steam chest cover. And I got that res resurfaced, I got the valve resurfaced, and now I've got to uh, attack the valve face and the ports themselves. So let me show you those pieces. This is the steam chest cover for the Skinner engine. Now this, if you go back into my old videos, was resurfaced on the, on the underside by uh, Dave, Rich Dave Richards, old steam-powered machine shop. He did it on his uh, G&E 32-inch shaper. And this thing had a lot of scoring. It was actually bowed quite a bit, he, he did find out. But now that this thing's been fully cleaned up, the running surfaces for the balance piston back there are perfectly flat and smooth. So all of the leakage that was occurring between the balance piston and the back side of the steam chest cover has technically been eliminated. So this is the slide valve assembly from the Skinner engine. And it's different from a standard slide valve. They call the original style a D-valve because it looks like a letter D sitting flat on its back, usually humped up in the middle. 
This is completely open to the exhaust. The exhaust is in the middle. And like I said, this surface of the balance piston rides on the back side of the steam chest cover. So it steam chest is pressurized in the case of the Skinner engine to 150 PSI. But inside this balance piston, which has a cast iron ring to seal, that's right in here. And that normally that ring goes in a groove inside the um, slide valve itself. And then these springs hold the balance piston up against the face of the steam chest. So this area is excluded from the pressurized um, steam chest. Let me get these springs out of here because we're going to need to use the slide valve itself. This was ground. Uh, these are the two-piece This is like a, a two-piece backup ring that holds the actual sealing ring against sealing ring rides against this upper surface. And that's what seals the inner bore of the balance piston. Then the back side of the balance piston. This has been resurfaced. I need to get uh, a cloth and clean this up. I'm going to blue this and use this as like a surface gauge against the face of the valve ports. I'm going to give this a very light stoning just to make sure I don't have any tiny, tiny rust particles standing up. Had to make some parts from Send Cut Send for the uh, mobile base for the Peerless Power Hacksaw. And I decided to go ahead and make another, this is a, a hook wrench that fits the quill, that's the locking ring on the quill on the K&T 2D rotary head mill. I'm going to send this to Keith Rucker. He has one that uh, it has like a double handled arrangement, but uh, this was a fun project to round over the edges of this. There's two quarter inch diameter locating holes exactly five inches apart. And if you fixture this, you, you just plunge through that with a mill and, and make a fixture plate. You can know the uh, axes and all, all the coordinates of all of these uh, roundovers and blends. And then you can put a roundover on this outer edge and have it come out real nice. And who knows, maybe you'll see Keith uh, put the part up and put the roundovers on it like uh, I did on this original. I'm getting ready to start the second part for the Spitfire accessory drive, which is the hub for this pulley. Um, did get my son convinced him to go with the double row bearing in this double row sealed bearing. He got maybe a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch more length than he needed for the actual parts, so not very generous with the material, but anyway. We'll make it work. And one of the features that uh, has to go in this part is a snap ring groove. So I ended up purchasing a solid carbide. It's a one millimeter. It looks like more than one millimeter uh, bit that you can plunge in and come across and put an internal snap ring groove and then just, you know, step back and increase the width of that if you want. But uh, that was a nice piece. It's actually 16th, 62 to 64 thousandths. Also got the upper arm uh, from the radial arm saw back from a weld repair and uh, took the time to take this 
locking stud out, which is a 5 8 fine thread left hand. And I cleaned up the OD a bit because it was a very close fit in, in that clearance hole. But what I'm going to end up doing is turning down uh, probably to about here and make, let's say, half inch to 5 eighths diameter tenon uh, with a shoulder. And then I'll take a mating piece, bore it with a healthy shrink fit, heat it up, press that on, and then have my son put a weld bead around there and I'll clean that back up. And then that'll give me the ability to put cross drills in that and, and have a locking lever. So not too difficult to repair. Um, <clears throat> we'll see how this cleans up. It's got a lot of weld material on there and this is obviously the registration bore. These are just so hard, the, you know, the nickel, all the spatter and everything is, is really, really hard. So I'm going to have to very gently clean that off. And when I clamp this up, I'm going to wedge something in here um, and on the back side so I can get these tightened somewhat. And then uh, this is a four and a quarter inch diameter piece. I'll get the mics on that, um, four to five inch mics, and get an exact diameter and try to determine what this was before, um, before all the work and all the distortion. But need to get this bottom surface and this bottom surface cleaned up well enough because this is what it registers on. And um, that's how we're going to be remachining this. If it does not work, if it does not clean up or the weld doesn't hold up, what I'm going to do is fabricate a new one. I got some uh, six by six by three quarter angle. I'll cut a slice of that and that'll give me a right angle mount here on the back. I'll gusset it. Short piece of three or four inch pipe, schedule 40 pipe. I think would be sufficient. I'll scallop it and I'll put another piece of pipe uh, on the front. After I put this mounting boss on for the indexing pin, I'll probably have features over here with another split and I'll just I'll clamp it from uh, from the front or from the side and it'll it'll serve the same purpose. You know the other thing that I thought about is that this floats up and down sits on this uh, shoulder up here and just has a very little bit of clearance once the bottom part of the arm bolts onto the other side but this could clamp axially top to bottom if I made a feature to take advantage of this. I could turn a, a shoulder on here and thread into the arm from below and then have a locking lever that would pull down and it would clamp these these surfaces against the, the top and bottom. And to me, that would be just as good. So, you know, I got, I got some options um, to try out. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. And um, got to get a couple of uh, cutters and a boring bar to be able to clean this up. I'll probably rough it with a roughing mill and I'll orbit this to get that cut very close to the original bore. Then I'll switch to a boring bar and try to just take the protruding parts back to the original original diameter. Okay, so back over here. This entire steam chest in the case of this engine is pressurized at 150 PSI. That's the boiler pressure I want to run. And at 300 RPM with 150 PSI, you know, I'm calculating this this engine is about a 150 horsepower engine. It's going to be an awesome engine to drive uh, a sawmill. So what I'd like to do is to get the valve actuator a little bit more out of the way by disconnecting this mechanism and letting that, letting that come back. That'll give me the room to set the valve in here after I've blued it and work it back and forth a little bit to see if I can get some, some high spots on this. So let me get my scraper in here first and see if I could brighten up the face of the, of the valve. I don't have a proper scraper for 
working on these valve surfaces. What I do have is this unit uh, called Baco, and it uses uh, carbide triangular inserts. There's other shapes available, but these are not a true triangle. They actually have a, a, a radius on them. They will rock, and so it will uh, tend to not have the corners dig in. We'll see how this does. It's, there's really not a lot of options for what will fit inside that steam chest because you're going to be working you know, deep inside that cavity. So uh, let's blue this up and let's see, let's see how everything works. I'm going to see if I can show you this valve surface a little closer. I would say it's uniformly scored. There do be, appear to be some areas that aren't scored along the edges of the exhaust port here. But there's a lot of horizontal scoring going on. And I'll tell you, I don't think there's going to be any chance of me accidentally removing too much metal with that scraper because this is a hardened iron surface and it just, <laughs> it feels like you're scraping on glass. I think the, basically what I'm removing is more dirt than anything, than actual particles of cast iron. So let's see if I can get that. Um, valve actuator moved back just a bit. It wasn't tight at all. I mean, it barely passed finger tight. A lot of gunk on it though. This rod actually would have to come out through the front, but I don't have a good means of loosening that uh, packing nut yet. I don't want to put a pipe wrench on it because I think it was nickel plated and I don't want to mar the surface. I want to make an actual, um, probably like a flare nut wrench, you know, to get on this and, and try to loosen it without hurting the surfaces. don't know that those would be threaded into this, but they might be. Different size again, which I might not have. Not sure I'm not sure if these are really threaded in or they're just gummy. Everything feels like it's coated in tar. Of course, I think that's what the uh, steam oil basically turns to at lower temperatures. And I guess they are threaded in. And then the nuts on the end were just like jam nuts to keep the joint together. <laughs> so this thing has to be unscrewed a bunch. Ending up moving the rod, actually moving the rod out. 
which is fine, except I really need to get that whole housing to move back. So I'm gaining about, I don't know, half inch, half to three quarters of an inch of clearance, plus the amount that that actuator has uh, recessed into the housing. Well, I'm gonna blue up the face of the slide valve, and let's see what kind of contact we have. I really don't have a good feel for how much of this I'm supposed to use. I think I might just have to punt and use my fingers because the glove is not doing a great job in spreading it. Man, a little goes a long way. You got far too much over here. Okay, well, what I see is a lot of contact right there, but difficult to see contact anywhere else. You would think there'd be little spots of blue. I think there's some in that upper corner. Yeah, some up there. So logic would tell me that I have to get in here and work those areas. And try to clean up some material off of those areas. Scrape away the blue. It is cutting. You gotta put a lot of pressure on it though. And that would make sense because it did appear to be polished here. What do you think after 50 iterations of this? Bluing it, chesting the contact, scraping away the little bit of metal, and eventually I'll have a flat surface again. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know that uh, it was fun to do a little bit of work to make some progress on this. Once I get, you know, a reasonable contact pattern established with the bluing on here, I will try to run this on air once again. I've got it set up for one inch uh, 
airline and I've got to get the big Quincy compressor running again but uh, I'd like to get this you know at least spinning and uh, start to see if there's any issues with the mechanism um, the timing I, I don't know if the timing is correct on the engine it appears to be correct but uh, you know lots of lots of fun projects we can work on I'm going to be putting the Spitfire body on this weekend with my son. So this will move over into the small shop, which is heated better. And uh, he's gonna continue fitting up, uh, making sure his clearance in the transmission tunnel is good, start to fit up the exhaust. He, he's got a lot of work on it, but this space will be more free to uh, concentrate on this. So thanks again for watching and subscribing. Uh, oh, I wanted to show you one other item that um, I'm gonna be taking care of. Thank you for watching and subscribing. Uh, appreciate all the new subscribers I've gotten in the last uh, month or so. And uh, stay tuned for more fun projects in the future on Engineers Workshop. And until then, as always, stay safe.